Hello everyone, my name is Oishiki. At first I would like to say that please kindly subscribe my channel. So, in our previous video that is Annie Frank part 2, we have read why, when and how Annie and her family went out for hiding from rest of the world in order to stay safe. So, in our today's video that is Annie Frank part 3, I am going to discuss how Annie's life was going on in the annex, which is their hiding place. So, now let's begin with our story. Thursday, July 9, 1942 Dearest Kitty, So, there we are. Father, mother and I walking in the pouring rain, each of us with a sanchet and shopping bag filled to the brim with the most varied astonishment of items. The people on their way to work at that early hour gave us sympathetic looks. You could tell by their faces that they were sorry they couldn't offer us some kind of transport and the conspicuous yellow star spoke to itself. Only when we were walking down the street did father and mother reveal little by little what the plan was. For months, we would have been walking as much of our furniture and apparel out of the apartment as we could. It was agreed that we would go into hiding on July 16 because of Maggot's call-up notice. The plan had to be moved forward 10 days, which meant we would have to make do with less orderly rooms. The hiding place was located in the father's office room. That's a little hard for outsiders to understand. So, I will explain. Father didn't have a lot of people working in the office. Just Mr. Cumbler, Mr. Kaleman, Meep, and a 23 years old deepest known as Beb Vosquagel, all of whom were informed of our coming. Mr. Vosquagel Beb's father works in that warehouse along with two assistants, none of whom were told anything. Here's a description of the building. The large warehouse on the ground floor is used to as a workroom and storeroom and is divided into different sections such as the stock room and divided by the milling room where chinamom, cloves and pepper substitute on the ground. Next to the warehouse is another outside door, a separate entrance to the office just inside the office door is a second door and beyond that is a stairway. At the top of the stairs is another door with a frosted window on which the word office is written in black letters. This is the big front office, very large very light and very full. 
Beep, Meep, and Mr. Caveman. What they do during the day? After passing through an alcove containing a safe, a wardrobe, a big stationery cupboard, you come to a small, dark, stiffy, black office. This used to be shared by Mr. Kungler and Mr. Van Dan. But now, Mr. Kungler is its only occupant. Mr. Kungler's office can also be reached from the passage, but only through a glass door that could be opened from the inside, but not easily from outside. If you leave Mr. Kungler's office and proceed, through the long, narrow passage, past the cold store, and go up four steps. You find yourself in the private office, the showpiece of the entire building. Elegant mahogany furniture, a leonium floor covered with rugs, a radio, a fancy lamp, everything first class. Next door is a spacious kitchen with the water heater and two gas rings, and beside that, a lavatory that's the first floor. A wooden staircase leads from the downstairs passage to the second floor. At the top of the stairs is a landing with doors on either sides. The door to the left takes you up to the spy storage area. Attic and loft in the front part of the house. A typically Dutch, very steep, ankle-twisting flight of stairs also run from the front part of the house to another door opening onto the streets. The door to the right of the landing leads to the secret annex at the back of our house. No one would ever suspect there were so many rooms behind that plain grey door. There's just one small step in front of the door and there you are inside. Straight ahead of you is a steep flight of stairs. To the left is a narrow hallway opening onto a room that serves as the Frank's family living room and bedroom. Next door is a smaller room, the bedroom and study of the two young ladies of the family. To the right of the stairs is a bathroom, a windowless room with just a sink. The door in the corner leads to the lavatory and another one of maggots and my room. If you go up the stairs and open the door at the top, you are surprised to see such a large, light and spacious room in an old canal side house. Like this, it contains a gas cooker, thanks to the fact that it used to be Mr. Kungler's lavatory and a sink. This will be the kitchen and bedroom for Mr. and Mrs. Van Dan, as well as the general living room, dining room and study for 
us all. A tiny side room is to be Peter Van Dan's bedroom. Then just as the front part of the building, there's an attic and a loft. So, there you are. Now, I have introduced you to the whole of our lovely annex. Yours, Annie. Friday, July 10, 1942. Dearest Kitty, I have probably bored you with all the long description of our house. But I still think you should know where I have ended up and how I ended up here in something you will work from my next letters. But first, let me continue my story because as you know, I haven't finished yet. After we arrived at 263, Prince St. Ratch, Meep, quickly led us through the long passage and up the wooden staircase to the next floor and into the annex. She shut the door behind us, leaving us alone. My God had arrived much earlier on her bike and was waiting for us. Our living room and all the other rooms were so full of stuff that I can't find the words to describe it. All the cupboard boxes that had been sent to the office in the last few months were piled on the floors and beds. The small room was filled from floor to the ceiling with linen. If we wanted to sleep in properly made beds that night, we had to get going and strengthen up the mess. Mother and Maggot were unable to move a muscle. They lay down on their bare mattress, tired, miserable, and I don't know what else. But father and I, the two cleaner-ups in the family, started in right away. All day long, we unpacked boxes, filled cupboards, hammered nails, and tidied up the mess until we fell exhausted into our clean beds at night. We hadn't eaten a hot meal all day, but we didn't care. Mother and Maggot were too tired and keyed up to eat, and Father and I were too busy. Tuesday morning, we started up where we left off the night before. Beep and Mip went shopping with our ration coupons. Father worked on our blackout screens. We scrubbed the kitchen floor and were once again busy from morning to night. Until Wednesday, I didn't have a chance to think about the enormous change in my life. Then, for the time since our arrival in the secret annex, I found a moment to tell you all about it and to release what had happened to me and what was yet to happen. Your Sani. Saturday, July 11, 1942. Dearest Kitty, Father, Mother and my God 
still can't get used to the seeming of the windstone clock, which tells us the time every quarter and hour. Not me. I liked it from the start. It sounds so reassuring, especially at night. You no doubt want to hear what I think of being in hiding. Well, all I can say is that I don't really know yet. I don't think I will ever feel at home in this house. But that doesn't mean I hate it. It's more like being on holiday in some strange pension. Kind of an old way to look at life in hiding. But that's how things are. The annex is an ideal place to hide in. It may be damp and lopsidated, but there's probably not a more comfortable hiding place in all of Amsterdam. No, in all of Holland. Up till now our bedroom with its blank walls was very bare. Thanks to father who brought my entire postcard and Flimstar's collection here beforehand and to a brush and a pot of glue. I was able to plaster the walls with pictures. It looked much more cheerful. When the Van Dance arrive, we will be able to build cupboards and other arms and end out of the wood piled in the attic. My God and Mother had recovered somewhat. Yesterday, Mother felt well enough to cook a split pea soup for the first time. But then she was downstairs talking and forgot all about it. The beans were so black and no amount of scrapping could get them out of the pan. Last night, the four of us went down to the private office and listened to England on the wireless. I was so scared. Someone might hear it that I literally begged father to take me back upstairs. Mother understood my anxiety and went with me. Whatever we do, we are very afraid that the neighbors might hear or see us. We started off immediately the first day sewing curtains. Actually, you could hardly call them that since there's nothing but scraps of fabric varying greatly in shape, quality and pattern which father and I stitched crookedly together with unskilled fingers. These works of art were tacked to the windows where they were still until we come out of hiding. The building on our right is a branch of the cake company, a firm from Zandem, and on the left is a furniture workshop. Though the people who work there are not on the premises after hours, any sound we make might travel through the walls. We have forbidden Maggot to cough at night, even though she has a bad cold. And 
are giving her large doses of condyne. I am looking forward to the arrival of Van Dan, which is set for Tuesday. It will be much more fun and also not as quiet. You see, it's the silence that makes me so nervous during the evening and nights. And I would give anything to have one of our helpers sleep there. It's really not that bad here since we can do our own cooking and can listen to the radio in daddy's office. Mr. Kaleman and Meep and Bep Vaskirjil too have helped us so much. We have already preserved loads of rhubarbs, strawberries and cherries. So, for the time being, I doubt we will be bored. We also have a supply of reading material and we are going to buy a lot of games. Of course, we can't even look out of the window or go outside. And we have to be quiet so the people of downstairs can't hear us. Yesterday, we had our hands full. We had to pit two catchers of cherries for Mr. Cutler to preserve. We are going to use the empty crates to make bookshelves. Someone's calling me. You're Sunny. Sunday, July 12, 1942. They were all so nice to me a month ago. Because my birthday and yet every day I felt myself drifting further away from mother and my God. I worked hard today and they praised me only to start picking on my aim gave five minutes later. You can easily See the difference between the way they deal with Maggot and the way they deal with me. For example, Maggot broke the vacuum cleaner and because of that, we have been without light for the rest of the day. Mother said, Well, Maggot, it is easy to see. You are not used to working. Otherwise, you would have to know better than to yank the plug out by the cord. Maggot made some reply and that was the end of the story. But this afternoon, when I wanted to rewrite something on mother's shopping list because her handwriting is so hard to read. She wouldn't let me. She tricked me off again. And the whole family got involved. I don't fit in with them. And I have felt that clearly in the last few weeks. They are so sentimental together. But... I would rather be sentimental on my own. They are always saying how nice it is with the four of us and that we get along so well without giving a moment's thought to the fact that I don't feel that way. Daddy, the one who understands me now and again. Though 
we usually side with mother and my god another thing i can't stand is having them talk about me in front of the outsider telling them how i cried or how sensibly i am behaving it's horrible and sometimes they talk about murji and i can't bear that murji is my weak spot i miss her every minute of the day and no one knows how often i think of her whenever i do my eyes fill with tears murji is so sweet and i can't love her so much that i kept dreaming that she will come back to us one day i have plenty of dreams but the reality is that we will have to stay here until the war is over we can't even go outside and the only visitor we can have our meep her husband jan vip vaskyojil mr vaskyojil and mr kumler mr kingman and mrs kingman though she hasn't come because she thinks it's too dangerous comment added by annie frank on september 8 28 1942 not being alone to be outside splits me more than i can say and i am terrified here hiding place will be discovered and that will be the shot that's of course is a fairly this meal prospect another comment added by annie frank on september 1942 daddy's always so nice to me he understands me perfectly and i wish we could have a heart to heart talk sometimes without my bursting instantly into tears but apparently that has to do with my age i would like to spend all time writing but that would probably go boring up till now i have only confided my thoughts to my diary and i still haven't get round to writing amusing sketches that i could read about at a later date in the future i am going to devote less time to sentimentalness and more time to reality so let's continue friday august 14 1942 dear kitty i have deserted you for an entire month but so little has happened that i can't find a new sorty item to relieve it every single day the van dance arrived on july 13 we thought they were coming out on the 14th but from the 13th to 16th the germans were sending out call up notice right and left and causing a lot of unrest so they decided it would be safer to leave a day too early than a day too late peter van dan arrived at 9:30 in the morning while we were still at breakfast peter's going on 16 a shy awkward boy whose company won't amount to much mr and mrs van dan 
came half an hour later. Much of our amusement, Mrs. Van Dan was carrying a hat box with a large chamber pot inside. I just don't feel at home without my chamber pot, she exclaimed, and it was the first time to find a permanent place under the divan instead of a chamber pot. Mr. Van D was lugging a collapsible tea table under his arm. From the first, we ate our meals together and after three days, it felt as if the seven of us had become one big family. Naturally, the Van Dans had much to tell about the week. We would be away from civilization. We were especially interested in what had happened to our flat and to Mr. Goldsmith. Mr. Van Dan filled us in. Monday morning at 9, Mr. Goldsmith phoned and asked if I could come over. I went straight away and found a very distraught Mr. Goldsmith. He showed me a note that the Frank family had left behind and instructed he was planning to take the cat to the neighbors, which I agreed with a good idea. He was afraid the house was going to be searched. So we went through all the rooms, tidying up here and there, and clearing the breakfast things off the table. Suddenly, I saw a notepad on Mrs. Frank's desk with an address in Maastricht written on it. Even though I knew Mrs. Frank had left it on purpose, I pretended to be surprised and horrified and begged Mr. Goldsmith to burn his enhancing piece of paper. I swore up and down that I knew, but that the no had been given me an idea. Mr. Goldsmith, I said, I bet I know what this address referred to us. About six months ago, a high-ranking officer came to the office. It seems he and Mr. Frank grew up together. He promised to help Mr. Frank if it was ever necessary. As I recall, he was stationed in Maastricht. I think this offer has kept his word and is somehow planning to help them cross over the Belgium and then to Switzerland. There's no harm in telling this to any friend of the Franks who come asking about them. Of course, you don't need to mention the part of Maastricht. And after that, I felt this is a story most of your friends have been told because I heard it later from several other people. We thought it was extremely funny, but we laughed even harder when 
Mr. Van Dan told us that the certain people have vivid imaginations. For example, one family living on our square claimed they saw all four of us riding by on our bikes early in the morning and another woman was absolutely positive we would have been loaded in some kind of military vehicle in the middle of the night your sanny friday august 12 1942 dear kitty now our secret annex has truly become secret because so many houses are being searched for hidden bicycles. Mr. Kungler thought it would be better to have a bookcase built in front of the entrance to our hiding place. It swings out on its hinders and opens like a door. Mr. Voskugel did the carpentry work. Mr. Voskugel has been told that the seven of us were in hiding and he's being most helpful. Now, whenever we want to go downstairs, we have to duck and then jump. After the first three days, we were all walking around with bumps on our foreheads from banging on our heads against the low doorway. Then Peter cushioned it by nailing a towel stuffed with wood severance to the door frame. Let's see if it helps. I am not doing much my schoolwork. I have been myself a holiday until September. Father wants to start giving me lessons then. But we have to buy all the books first. There's little change in our lives here. Peter's hair was washed today. But there's nothing special. Mr. Van Dan and I are always at longer heads with each other. Mummy always treats me like a baby, which I can't stand. For the rest things are being better. I don't think Peter's gotten any nicer. He is an obnoxious boy who lies around on his bed all day only rousing himself and to do a little carpentry work before returning to his lap. What a cloth! Mummy gave me another one of her dreadful sermons. This morning, we take the opposite views on everything. Daddy's a sweetheart. He may get mad at me, but it never lasts longer than five minutes. It is a beautiful day outside. Nice and hot. And in spite of everything, we make the most of the weather be loving on the folding bed in the attic. Wednesday, September 2, 1942. Dearest Kitty, Mr. and Mrs. Van Dan have had a terrible argument. I have never seen anything like that. Since mother and father 
won't dream of shouting at each other like that. The argument was based on something so trivial it didn't seem worth wasting a single word on it. Oh well, to each his own. Of course, it's very difficult for Peter who gets caught in the middle. But no one takes Peter seriously anymore. Since he's hypensively and lazy. Yesterday, he was beside himself with worry because his tongue was blue instead of pink. This rare phenomenon disappeared as quickly as it came. Today, he's walking around with a thick scarf on because he's got a stiff neck. His Highness has been complaining of lumbago. He's got two ankles and pains in his heart. Kidneys and lungs are also part of the course. He is an absolute hypoclonetic. That's the right word, isn't it? Mother and Mrs. Van Dan aren't getting along very well. There are enough reasons for the friction. To give you one small example, Mrs. Van D has removed all but there of our streets from our colonial linen. Comment added by Annie on September 21, 1942. Mr. Van Dan has been as nice as a pie to my recently. I have said nothing but has been enjoying it while it lasts. So let's continue. She is amusing that mothers can't be used for both families. She will be in for a nasty surprise when she discovers that mother has followed her lead. Furthermore, Mistress Van Dan is miffed because we are using her china instead of our own. She is still trying to find out what we have done with our plates. They are a lot closer than she thinks since they are placed in cardboard boxes in the attic behind a load of opecta advertising material. As long as we are in hiding, the plates will remain out of her reach. Since I am always having accidents, it's just as well yesterday I broke one of the Mrs. Van Dan's soup bowls. Oh, she angrily exclaimed, can't you be more careful? That was my last one. Please bear in mind, Kitty, that the two ladies speak abominable Dutch. I don't dare comment on the gentleman. They would be highly insulted. If you were to hear their band attempts, you would laugh your head off. We have given up pointing out their errors since correcting them doesn't help anyway. Whenever I quote mother or Mrs. Van Dan, I will write proper Dutch instead of trying 
a duplicate their speech. Last week, there was a brief interruption in our motorious routine. This was provided by Peter and a book about women. I should explain that Megot and Peter are allowed to read nearly all the books Mr. Kaleman lends us. But the adults prefer to keep this special book to themselves. This immediately be quite Peter's curiosity. What forbidden fruit did it contain? He sneaked off with it when his mother was downstairs talking and took himself and his booty to the loft. For two days all was well. Mrs. Van Dan knew what he was up to but kept mum until Mr. Van Dan found out about it. He threw a fit, took the book away and amused that it would be the end of the business. However, he would neglect to take his son's curiosity into account. Peter, not in the least fazed by his father, swift action, began thinking up ways to read the next of this vastly interesting book. In the meantime, Mrs. Van D asked Mother for her opinion. Mother didn't think this particular book was suitable for my God, but she saw no harm in letting her read most other books. You see, Mrs. Van Dan, Mother said, there's a big difference between Magot and Peter. To begin with, Magot's a girl, and girls are always more mature than boys. Secondly, she's already read many serious books and doesn't go looking for those which are no longer forbidden. Third, my God's much more sensible and is inactually advanced as a result of her four years at an excellent school. Mrs. Van Dan agreed with her but felt it was wrong as a matter of principle to let the youngsters read books written for adults. Meanwhile, Peter had thought of a suitable time when no one would be interested in either him or the book. At 7.30 in the evening, when the entire family was listening to the wireless in the private office. He took his treasure and stole off to the loft again. He should have been back by 80.30. But he was so engrossed in the book that he forgot the time and was just coming down the stairs when his father entered the room. The sin that followed was not surprising after a slap and watched and a tug of war. The book lay on the table and Peter was in the loft. This is how Matt stood where it was time for the family to eat. Peter stayed upstairs. No one gave him a moment's thought. He would have to go to bed without his dinner. 
We continued eating, chatting merrily away, when suddenly we heard a piercing whistle. We lay down our forks and stared at each other. The shock, easily visible on our pale faces. Then we heard Peter's voice through the chimney. I won't come down. Mr. Van Dan leapt up, his napkin falling to the floor and shouted with the blood rushing to his face. I have had enough. Father, afraid of what might happen, grabbed him by the arm and the two men went to the attic. After much struggling and kicking, Peter ended up in his room with the door shut and we went on eating. Mrs. Van Dan watched to save a piece of bread for her darling son. But Mr. Van Dan was adamant. If he doesn't apologize this minute, he will have to sleep in the loft. He protested that going without dinner was enough the punishment. What if Peter was to catch cold. We wouldn't be able to call a doctor. Peter didn't apologize and returned to the loft. Mr. Van Dan decided to leave well enough alone. Though he had noted that next morning that Peter's bed has been slept in. At seven, Peter went to the attic again, but he persuaded to come downstairs when father spoke a few friendly words to him. After three days of sullen looks and stubborn silence, everything was back to normal. Your Sani Monday, September 21 1942 Dearest Kitty, Today I will tell you the general news here in the annex. A lamp has been moulded above my divan bed so that in the future when I hear the guns going off I will be able to put a cord and a switch on the light. I can't use it at the moment because we are keeping our window open a little day and night. The male member of the Van Dan contrugent have built a very handy wood stained food safe with real screens. Up till now, this gorgeous cupboard has been located in Peter's room. But in the interest of fresh air, it's been moved to the attic. When it was once stood, there's not a shelf. I advise Peter to put his table underneath the shelf and added a nice rug and hang his own cupboard where the table now stands. That might make his little cup hole more comfy, though I certainly won't like to sleep there. Mrs. Van Dan is unbearable. I continually being scolded for my instant chatter when I am upstairs. I simply let the words bounce right off me. Madame now has 
a new trick up herself, trying to get out of the washing, the pots and pans. If there's a bit of food left at the bottom of the pans, she leaves it to spoil instead of transferring it to a glass dish. Then, in the afternoon, when my God is struck with the cleaning, all the pots and pans, Madame exclaims, Oh, poor my God! You have so much work to do. Every other week, Mr. Cateman brings me a couple of books written for girls my age. I am in his sweetick about the Jup the Hill series, and I have enjoyed all the Kissy Van Mars Vedic's book very much. I have read the Zani Summer four times and the ludicrous situation still make me laugh. Father and I are currently working on our family tree and he tells me something about each person as we go along. I have begun my school work. I am working hard at French cramming five irregular verbs into my head every day. But I have forgotten much too much of what I learned in school. Peter has taken up his English with great reluctance. A few school books have just arrived and I brought a large supply of exercise books, pencil, rubbers and labels from the house. Pim, that's our pet's name, for father wants me to help him with his Dutch lessons. I am perfectly willing to reach him in exchange for his assistance with the French and other subjects. But he makes the most unbelievable mistakes. I sometimes listen to the Dutch broadcast from London. No one here understands why I take such an interest in the royal family. A few nights ago, I was in the topic of discussion. As we all decided, I was enormous. As a result, I threw myself into my school works. The next day, since I have little desire to still be the first form. When I am 14 or 15. The fact that I am hardly allowed to read anything was also discussed. At the moment, mothers reading, gentlemen, wives and servants. And of course, I am not allowed to read it, though my God is. First, I have to be more intellectually developed, like my genius of a sister. Then we discussed my inarrogance of philosophy, physiology and physiology. I immediately looked up these three big words in the dictionary. It's true. I don't know anything about the subjects, but maybe I will have learned more by the next year. I have come to the shocking conclusion that I have only one long sleep dress 
and three cardigans to wear in the winter. Father's given me pension to knit a white jumper. The wool isn't very pretty, but it will be worn and that's what counts. Some of our clothing was left with friends, but unfortunately, we won't be able to get it until after the war, provided it's still there, of course. I would just finish writing up something about Mrs. Van Dan when she walked into the room. Thump! I stamped the book shut. Hey, Annie! Can't they even take a pic? No, Mrs. Van Dan. Just the last page then? No, even not the last page, Mrs. Van Dan. Of course, I nearly died. Since this particular page contained a rather unflattered description of her. There's something happening every day, but I'm too tired and lazy to write it all down. Your Sani. So story ends here. In my next video, I'm going to read Annie Frank part 4. If you liked my today's video, then please kindly like and comment my video. And also please subscribe my channel to listen to more such stories. And also to follow all my videos regularly. And don't forget to click on the bell icon. Thank you.